talk a little bit about um, well, here. This is sort of an outline of the talk. So first, just very quickly, we talk about the biomedical idea about what the common cold is, which you probably already know. Um, and then we'll talk about Chinese medicine and the common cold, including the causes and how the body reacts, and then some ideas about prevention and some stuff about treatment, mostly some food therapy stuff. Um, but first, my name is Gray. In case you maybe you knew that, is it in the flyer or something like that? Mm -hmm. Did you see a flyer? I don't know how you know. I can see flyer. your name on the calendar, oh. but it might have been. Oh, okay. Okay, well, my name is Greg Livingston. Um, I am a Chinese medicine doctor. I just recently moved to Portland for China. And I, I'm a licensed physician in China. I'm one of the only Westerners ever licensed to practice Chinese medicine in China. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent off and on more than 10 years in China. Did you go to school in China? Yeah, my PhD is in Chinese medicine. Spent a lot of time there. I know a fair amount about Chinese medicine. I'm doing this almost 20 years. So. Wow. Were you already fluent in Chinese before you went? No, I learned Chinese there. But it's almost 20 years now I've been in Chinese. So. My Chinese is pretty good. <laughs> okay. So, so about biomedicine, right? A cold is a viral infection. There's all different kinds of viruses. They're called rhinoviruses. That's probably the most common kind. But colds are also called upper respiratory tract infection, or short U R T I, upper respiratory tract infection. It's just a viral infection of the respiratory tract, typically the upper part. If it goes down really deep into the lungs, then that's that would be called bronchitis, or it could be pneumonia. But the upper respiratory tract includes the sinuses and the throat and the, the upper part of the, the airways. Okay. Um, it's actually the most common of all human illnesses, which is not really surprising because <laughs> everybody gets a cold now. <laughs> but typically, adults will get two or five colds a year. Um, some people don't hardly ever get sick. Sick a lot more than that. And then kids get sick more. Um, probably just because they don't wash their hands so much. And they're always touching stuff and then rubbing their face and that kind of thing. And their immune system is maybe a little weaker. So they tend to get sick a little bit more. And actually, when I was living in China, I got sick a lot more than that. But it's mostly because of the air pollution. That's, that's actually why I left China. Too much of an issue, and it was taking a toll on my health. I mean, all along it was taking a toll on my health, but I just got tired of it. So I get sick at the drop of a hat. Here, I've been here nine months, I've only had one really, really minor cold, and there I'll get sick easily every month. But of course, I work in a hospital there, and mm -hmm. so there's tons of sick people. But it doesn't even matter, even without that, I still get sick there. Just because there's so many people. And the pollution kind of irritates the, the airways and makes you more vulnerable to infection. So according to biomedicine, there's no cure, or there's no proven cure. Right? They've done research on, say, vitamin C. And some people said, oh yeah, vitamin C is helpful, and some people said it's not. I think it probably is a little bit helpful. Yeah. At least it's somewhat helpful. It doesn't once you have a cold, you take a bunch of vitamin C, it doesn't immediately go away. It's helping a little bit, right? And zinc also can be helpful to prevent to some extent. But according to you know, the establishment, there's no real cure for the cold. There's just some symptomatic treatment, like whatever, NyQuil or Tylenol cold and flu. You know, just dry up your sinuses and stop the cough and that kind of stuff. So, but anyway, colds are generally self-limiting no matter what. After a week or whatever, they just go away. Unless you have some other problem that causes the cold to become uh, you know, 
some get some complication. Like an elderly or weak people or immunosuppressed people, those people can die from colds. They start out with a with a cold and then develop pneumonia or something like that and they can die. So actually colds and flus kill tens of thousands of people every year. But indirectly you start you're maybe hospitalized and then you get a cold and then you die from that's very typical to elderly people or cancer patients. So generally it's pretty mild, right? But it can get complications. So then in Chinese medicine, the, the common cold is called gan ma. Gan means to get something. Ma means a hat. So it's just like you got something covering your head. Which is kind of what it feels like, right? But gan mao, now when you say gan mao in Chinese, no one thinks, you know, you're covered by a hat. It just means, it's like when we say, catch a cold, no one's like, okay, you got a catcher's mitt and you're catching <laughs> some cold thing. We don't think about the language, right? It's just, gan cold equates this illness. And the same with gan mao in Chinese, no one's thinking. That's a really strange you know, way to talk about it. No one thinks about it that way. Just like no one thinks catching a cold sounds weird in English. <laughs> it actually does, if you think about it, catching a cold. So in any case, according to Chinese medicine, there's many different causes. So the Chinese medicine is ancient, right? So no one knew about viruses 2,000 or even a few hundred years ago. Probably the discovery of viruses is uh, maybe a couple hundred years or so. So no one knew about viruses, right? So they didn't say, oh, you know, gan mao is because of the virus. They had to figure out some other way to understand what was happening, right? So they, you know, through centuries of observation and clinical practice and this kind of thing, they, they developed their own ideas about what causes gan mao, right? So there's different things that cause it and different types of gan mao. Kind of like with the biomedical idea, and there's different viruses that cause gamma or other respiratory tract infection, but still the idea is very different than the biomedical idea, right? And because there's different causes and different types, then of course there's no single treatment for gamma. Because they all have different etiology, all have different cause. So you treat according to what's causing it. And the the nature of this illness and not, you know, like biomedicine, oh, you know, just control some symptoms or take some antiviral medication. It's not like that. So there's no single treatment. And actually, diagnosis and treatment of gamma is very complicated. It's very complicated. It's, you would think, oh, it's kind of a simple problem, so it shouldn't be that difficult to treat. Actually, infectious disease, and, you know, this is a relatively mild infectious disease, obviously, but infectious disease is very complicated stuff, and to be very good at treating gut mal in Chinese medicine is not easy at all. There's some simple things that most practitioners know to do, and some people practice in kind of a simple way, but if you really want to, you know, uh, refine your skill and be good at treating that, then it's actually not so easy. Big books and old books that talk about infectious disease. There's one book called Sang Han Lun, that's my PhD is on this book. Sang Han Lun is actually a book written about infectious disease. And the first chapter of that book they call Tai Yang Tian. It's the chapter of the Tai Yang vessel, which is essentially these kind of exterior disorders like common cold. When the pathogen first invades your body. You have some fever, chills, like that. So that's actually the largest chapter in that book. It's really, really complicated. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and there's also many methods in Chinese medicine to prevent colds. So that's the main thing we'll talk about today. Because this treatment stuff is way too complicated. You have to go to school for that. But the prevention stuff, that's really easy. So. That's what you want to know. And then you don't have to go to doctors. It's always better to avoid doctors if you can. Mm -hmm. 
He's a Chinese doctor. Yeah. Just learn to take care of yourself, right? That's the so according to Chinese medicine, gamma is an invasion of some external pathogenic factor. Right? And the ancient Chinese didn't know about viruses, but they knew that somehow something from the outside invaded your body and made you sick. So they just use their own language and worldview at the time. They call this stuff xie qi. Xie means some pernicious or evil thing, some mm -hmm. bad thing. And qi is qi, right? You've heard this word qi, right? Mm -hmm. It's just some thing that invades your body. And they, they talk about six different kinds of pathogenic factors, external pathogenic factors. So those would be wind, cold, heat, damp, dryness, and so on. Those all have some kind of nature and they affect your body in different ways and they tend to be dominant at different times of year. For example, fall is related to wind. Right? I mean, maybe Portland, I don't know if you get windy here in the fall. It does. It gets windy in the spring. In the spring. Uh -huh. um, oh, sorry, what am I talking about? Dryness is related to the fall. Spring is related. <laughs> um, and cold is related to um, winter. So in China, especially in the northern part of China, it gets really dry in the fall. And then the lung is easily affected by that. And the lung despises dryness. The lung is you know, an organ that actually touches the external environment. Right? It's literally just a fold here folds in in your nose and mouth, and it's just folding in. But it's actually touching the external environment, right? Mm -hmm. And the cells that line the lung, the respiratory tract, are the same type of cells as your skin, are called epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. So those things are related to each other. Even the ancient Chinese knew that the lung and the skin were related. Somehow they figured that out. But modern science also shows some correlation between those two. So in any case, the lung is very vulnerable in, um, in the autumn, probably because of that dryness, but also the cold, because it starts to get cold, and then in the winter, of course, it's getting cold. Cold also usually affects the lung. And of course, the lung is what's being affected by a right? Okay. Um, here I got it right. Autumn is the next. Oh, no. Sorry, autumn is dry. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry about that. I should say dry. Um, so, uh, gamma is this invasion of external pathogenic qi, right? And predominantly wind and cold. Again, because wind is related to autumn, and that's one of the reasons the cold is related to winter. But in Chinese, we say bai bing. Uh, Related to Pai Bing is like the all illnesses are related to wind. That the all illnesses ride on wind. That somehow wind drives pathogens into the body um, and easily makes you sick. So this wind, uh, even if wind is related to spring, but it kind of doesn't matter what season it's related to, but the wind and the cold easily penetrate the body. So, and then they, they start out on the exterior of the body. So this first goes to the superficial layers, and that's where the cold is. So it's some pathogenic tree that just first, the early stage invades the body and gets stuck in the superficial layer of the body, and then you have some symptoms. And it's, um, the symptoms are actually, you know, the next slide shows that. They're, it's a battle between this pathogenic Qi, the xie qi, and we call it zheng qi, which is the good qi in your body. It's just your body's normal function. So you start duking it out, mm -hmm. and then you get some symptoms. Right? But in any case, wind and cold tend to impair immune function, in particular cold. So if you get, if your body temperature goes below a certain point, because your body temperature is constant, right? your internal temperature is constant. It doesn't fluctuate much at all. If your body temperature comes 
down a little bit, your immune system functions less effectively. Actually, the white cells start to slow down, and just the immune system doesn't function so efficiently, um, which is one of the reasons that you know, your body will run a fever when you get an infection, because that ramps up immune system function. Plus, it makes it a little bit inhospitable for whatever bacteria or virus might be there. But it, it, one of the main things that the fever does is ramp up immune system function. So if you get cold, and you're out in the wind and cold and you get a chill, then your immune system function can go down a little bit. And then the virus, which is just always there, the virus is just always there. There's always some virus in your nose, in your hands, in your like that. Almost always. Then those things can get a hold. Because normally your immune system is you know, holding them back. And then one of the reasons I think that wind really affects people is because if it's cold and you just stand in a cold room with no wind and you don't move, you'll be okay. But as soon as there's any wind, then that cold air gets blown across you and it just starts wicking the heat out of your body. Like wind chill factor, right? So the wind just drives the cold and pulls the heat out of your body even faster. So wind and cold together make you sick. I mean, it's the same reason, I think, why in English we must say catching a cold. Because you go out in the cold, and you, know, you get cold, and then you get sick. So that cold you know, impairs the immune system function, and then you get sick. So the ancient Chinese had a similar idea, actually. And I think early on in the West, we also had this idea, that somehow this idea has been lost on us. But most people still know that you shouldn't go out in the cold, otherwise you, know, you get sick. Modern medicine doesn't pay much attention to that at all. So this is about when the zheng qi, uh, which is this good qi in the body. Right? Zheng qi is just, zheng means upright, upstanding, something like that. It's all the different function in your body that comes together that makes you strong. And it's, it has some integrity as a physical being. Mm -hmm. So in the Neijing, this old book on Chinese medicine, this over 2,000 year old book, sort of revival of Chinese medicine, Neijing says, in Chinese it says, qi cun nei, xie wu ke gan, means when zheng qi is present in the interior, so it means when your body is strong, then the evil qi is unable to attack you. Mm -hmm. So that means if you have you know, a strong body, then you can't get sick. I mean, of course, if the pathogenic factor is really, really strong, then okay, it will overwhelm your really good junk sheet. But the point remains that it's important to, yeah, maybe. I mean, there are some things like ionizing radiation, yeah. right? <laughs> it doesn't really matter how strong you are, you're going to get radiation. But generally speaking, the stronger your body is, then the better off you are. And you won't so easily get sick. So then you have to figure out how to keep your junk sheet strong. Right? That's probably the key right there. And then you can go around and there's people getting sick all around you and you don't get sick. Right? Your junk sheet is fighting the shit. Is that the Wei Chi? Wei Chi is part of that. Yeah, Wei Chi is defensive qi. Mm -hmm. So zheng qi is all the qi in the body. It includes wei qi and all the qi from the organs and channel qi. And that all those qi come together mm -hmm. and that's called zheng qi. So in Chinese, zheng and xie are juxtapositions. Those two, those two ideas are only used in opposition to each other. Because zheng is all the good stuff in your body and xie is anything that can so jung is not one specific type of qi, it's just your body's overall function. So jung and xie are kind of opposites. Okay. So that's from, from the Jing. So very early on, the ancient Chinese knew that your body could defend itself. And then the, the trick is how do you make your jung qi strong, right? 
and Chinese medicine has a lot to say about that. <laughs> okay. So how this happens, right, is first, if your zheng shi is weak or impaired in some way, or even just maybe momentarily, you go out and get chills when that impairs the zheng shi, right? That cold qi enters the body and impair the zheng shi. Then the xie qi comes in. Right? So xie qi invades, and then the body attempts to eliminate it. I try to kick it out with zheng qi. And then there's this fight between zheng and xie. And then you get symptoms. Maybe it's a fever, chills, something like that. Right? That's just show that the body is fighting. It's a similar idea to biomedicine also, right? The fever, chills, all that stuff is just some reaction to this virus. So in terms of how to prevent that, I mean, the first thing, obviously, would be to avoid some shit. Right? So it's just obvious stuff, like limiting your exposure to shit, shit, like avoiding crowds and avoiding sick people. And you can even wear a cotton mask if you want, because even the ancient Chinese said that those pathogens invade through the lungs, through the nose and the mouth. That, that idea actually comes later. That's part of the cult of what you feel. It's this warm, cocoon school of thought, which is like a late Ming, early Qing dynasty development, like 400 years old or so. But those guys said that the pathogen invades through the nose and the mouth, first attacking the lungs. So wearing a, a mask, I'm sure that'll help keep viruses out of your respiratory tract. And I mean, in China, that's really common. People just walk around with masks all the time. Like you never, you would never even you know, look twice at somebody wearing a mask. It's so common here. People would wonder what's going on with this person if you're wearing a mask. But still, I think even if you're if you're the kind of person that easily gets sick, then maybe if you go on through authorized public transportation, or if you go on the plane, maybe a lot of people get sick on planes, then okay, wear a mask, so what? Just get one of those little cotton masks from Walgreens, or from the doctor, or whatever, this little disposable mask, and just wear that when you're on the plane. And that will actually help you not get sick. It'll also keep your hands out of your face, because it'll remind you Oh yeah, I shouldn't put my hands unless I just wash them in my face. That's one way to get viruses to practice by touching the face. So that's actually not a bad idea. That's not a Chinese medicine idea, but it doesn't matter. It's still a very important way to prevent yourself from getting sick. Of course, that's really only if you if you just really easily get sick. And then, of course, hygiene. And this actually is also a Chinese medicine idea, but modern medicine a lot about this too. That just washing your hands a lot, especially you go out in public places, and people always sneeze, and then you know, just do that, and then they go and touch doorknobs and that kind of stuff, and the elevator button, and there's viruses there. So when you're out in public, just remember to keep your hands off your face until you have a chance to wash your hands. And then you know, do a really good job washing your hands. Because that actually is one of the main ways that viruses enter your body. Is you have some on your hand and you rub your eye, or you scratch your nose, or something like that, and the virus enters. Of course, there's viruses floating around in the air, too. Yeah. But, but a lot of times it's on the hands. Okay. Then, about, this is more maybe a Chinese medicine idea, but this is not entirely poor idea in the West either that you know you should kind of avoid going out in wind and cold and rain and that kind of stuff or at least dress for it. Right? But wind and cold are the most common pathogens. Like I said, because they drive wind drives that cold qi into the body. And the cold impairs well the wind qi and that depends on wind qi. And then the pathogen could go in. So generally avoiding wind and cold. 
Um, so how do you do that? Well, of course, by dressing it warmly. Um, and Chinese people especially pay attention to keeping the feet warm, or just even the lower limbs, but especially the feet, and then also the neck. So Westerners tend to keep the trunk warm. And I don't know where this idea comes from. It's probably some somewhere from biomedicine that you know, if you keep the trunk warm, then you're good to go. It doesn't really matter if your feet are cold or what. As long as your trunk is warm, then you're fine. But actually, that's not the case at all. Chinese medicine says that cold enters the body through the feet. Hmm. So it's really important to keep the feet warm. I think Western science says cold enters the body through the feet. Oh, maybe, yeah. But maybe, maybe not Western. Yeah. Western. yeah, that's a good point. Probably Western science has uh, uh, found that out. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah. yeah. But what happens from a Chinese medicine perspective is that, you know, there's these vessels, or some people translate as meridians or channels or whatever, that travel to the body, and the cold enters those in the feet and then travels through them to other parts of the body. Um, and I'm not a big believer in, in metaphysics. I just think that there's a, a logical explanation for everything and you can figure it out. It's very hard to figure most stuff out, but if you could figure it out, then there probably is a logical explanation behind everything. But in the meantime, then we can use some kind of less logical way to explain a seemingly metaphysical way to describe stuff. Like that's what I think about qi. I don't really think there is a qi. I just think qi is a word that describes different phenomena. Really, any phenomena you can use the word qi to describe. Like this table has kind of qi, and the air is kind of qi, and this pathogen is a kind of qi, and your body is just qi, is a kind of qi. But is that, does that mean there's a thing that we'll find this qi? There's one thing and we're going to find it someday. I, I don't really think so. Well, it I might think that's energy. energy. If I can right. feel energy. Well, you feel yeah. something and you call it energy. But mm -hmm. what that thing is, I mean, is it really like just energy? Force. Yeah, that, that's yeah. some very complicated thing. Okay. That it's if you, different than life, though. I've been, really, I've been having some metaphysical discussions about that, I think. Uh, well, that. Life force that you're talking about is an immaterial life force, and lying is a material phenomenon that it happens because of EM radiation. And there's a real difference between the two. Right. You may not feel a lot of difference, but there's a real difference between the two. So, you know, so I think what Greg is saying is sort of accurate. We're using words that we know about to describe things that we can sense, right. but we don't really have words right. that really describe Yeah, them. like those phenomena are real. Like I believe you feel something, mm -hmm. but what that thing actually yeah. is, is so complicated that there's kind of no way to really describe it mm -hmm. other than you just say it's energy, which is fine. And I'm not saying that that's, that is not real, mm -hmm. but I don't think that you know using chi or energy, those words, is really an accurate description. It's a label, which is fine, because that's all we have. Mm -hmm. So I use the word chi all the time, because mm -hmm. that word is actually very useful to describe something that's so complicated there's really no other way to describe oh, okay. it. Okay, thank you. But in any case, the same thing about this cold entering the body, and it's not, it's, I don't really think it's metaphysical. Literally, if you put your hand in ice water, then of course the blood vessels in your hand, on the surface of your hand, will contract, right? Because the body is shunting the blood away from the surface of the body to preserve your body heat, right? So you put your hand in ice water, and then all those blood vessels contract. That contraction actually makes its way up the vessels. That effect passes through the blood vessels. And people that have coronary artery disease, if you put their hand in ice water, you can trigger a heart attack. Mm -hmm. and they'll start to have spasm in the coronary artery. That's the cold chi traveling through the vessels. So the same thing happens with your feet. When your feet are cold, that cold chi just 
but the effect that it travels through your body and impairs your normal physiological function. And one of the things that impairs that is the immune system. And then we easily get sick. Or even, for example, like a very common problem would be um, dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation. That in Chinese medicine is usually related to cold. And where does that cold come from? Mostly it comes from the heat. The cold invades the body through the heat. And literally the effect of the cold passes through the vessels in the lower abdomen and make the blood vessels in the uterus kind of spastic and impair the blood circulation in the uterus and you get pain. Because anytime there's impaired blood circulation, there's pain. Same thing if you put your hand in that ice water, very quickly it will become excruciatingly painful and you have to take your hand out. That's actually a test for pain tolerance. You put, have people with their hand in ice water and see how long they can keep it there. Usually you can't keep it there for very long. It actually becomes excruciating because the blood circulation is being impaired and then the tissues don't have blood and then it starts to hurt. So a lot of problems in Chinese medicine are, are attributed to cold, this cold qi that invades the body. But for me, I don't even think of that as medicine people. That's real stuff. That's why Chinese don't like to take cold stuff. They don't take any cold drinks, raw food. All those things are cold and they cause contractions. They impair circulation, cause problems. So in any case, it's really important to stay warm, and especially the feet. I do see, I remember in China seeing, and you see there aren't your feet, but it's, it's very obvious in China because in China people dress so warmly, almost too much. But you'll see some Western tourists there, it's really cold weather, and it gets cold in China. Maybe they got a down jacket, but then wearing shorts and even yeah. sandals. Yeah. You know, and the Chinese people just they, they see those foreigners and go, like, "Oh my God, what are those people doing?" You know, they don't they know that's bad for them, and, or they just think Westerners have you know like the constitution of an ox that they can do that. That's the other reaction they have. Oh, you know, Chinese people can never do that. We're too weak. You know, but Westerners are strong and they can get away with that. But actually, Westerners don't get away with it. Maybe a little bit, but oftentimes there's, their illnesses can be traced back to that kind of behavior. So it's not enough to just stay warm up here and let your limbs you know, freeze. That will cause all kinds of problems, not just getting the gum out. All kinds of problems, or even digestive problems if people have a ulcer or some kind of stomach problem. Cold feet will also make that worse. Because again, that cold passes through the feet and up the channels and into the GI tract and then affects the stomach. So people with ulcers in China, they're always like, oh, you have to make sure you're beautiful. But you would never find an MD here that said, you know, cold feet are related to your ulcer. But I guarantee you it's true that it will impair your ability to heal an ulcer if your feet are always cold. The same thing with you know preventing gut mouth. You need to keep the feet warm. And then the neck wind just likes to enter the body through here. So it's good to have a scarf to keep the wind cold. And of course that makes sense too because you have all these lymph nodes with all kinds of immune stuff happening in this area. Why is that? Because air enters here and virus and bacteria and fungus and whatever stuff, all that stuff goes into your respiratory tract. There's got to be a ton of white blood cells there to meet that stuff and heat it up. So this area needs to be warm for that stuff to be really active. If this area gets cold, then even just the immune function in this local area slows down. Then the virus gets a hold and it gets gone up. Right, so keep the neck warm. It's really important. Isn't this the same thing as the band in the collar? I don't know. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, but yeah, part of it I think is also just modesty. Oh. Because Chinese people generally don't like to expose their body at all. And that's why Chinese medicine makes its own pulse diagnosis. Uh -huh. It's the only part of the body with that thing for a pulse. Um, and then this, 
is a saying in Chinese, Chun Duan, Chu Du. In the spring, you want to dress a little bit warmly, and in the autumn, you dress a little bit cool. Um, in, that's assuming that the weather in spring and autumn is roughly equivalent, right? You're transitioning one from summer to winter, and one from winter to summer, and you know, it's, it's not a freezing or boiling hot, it's just a cool. So why in the spring should be a little dress a little bit more warmly? And in the autumn, you dress a little more cool. So this has to do with yin yang, right? yin yang theory. So winter belongs to yin, and summer belongs to yang. Right? And your qi in the winter goes into the interior. Right? That, it's kind of just like I was saying about when you put your hand in cold water, that the blood vessels contract and push the blood more to the interior. This is, that's one manifestation of that phenomena, that the cold just forces your chi more towards the center, right? So that you're, it's not all out on the surface and easily dispersed or absorbed by the cold. It goes inside and you, you preserve it, right? So in order to make your chi go in, in the fall, you want to dress a little on the cool side. Because the being exposed to the cool will make your pores close, make the blood vessels contract a little bit, start shunting the blood toward the interior, start moving your chi all inside. So in the fall, you dress a little on the cool side, not like running around in your underwear, but you, know, you don't need, unless you really easily get sick, you don't want to overdress in the fall, because that will actually pull the chi to the surface. And then when the winter comes along, your chi is too superficial, and then the cold easily attacks your body. You want to kind of push it in. And then the opposite is in the spring. So in the spring, you're coming out of winter, and your chi is all on the interior during the winter. You want to coax it out so that when you get into summer, your chi is on the surface, and you easily disperse heat, and you don't get overheated and that kind of thing. So you dress a little bit more warmly in the spring, and that helps draw the blood and the chi to the surface of the body. So that's the proper way to dress, according to the Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the fall, just you can let yourself be exposed a little bit to the cold in the fall. And you know, that helps your body acclimate to the sea. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then in terms of lifestyle, this is mostly pretty obvious, right? Proper exercise. Which is different for everybody, by the way. Just do as much exercise as fits your constitution, right? And the kind of exercise that makes you feel good. And then rest is very important, and particularly it's good to go to bed early. So, you know, some people will think that, oh, no matter what, if you get eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour period, you're fine. It's all the same, but it's not actually. Even modern research shows that. People who work night shifts and people who work um, in the airline industry and fly through a lot of time zones where their biological clock is not uh, is being messed with all the time because they're moving through a lot of time zones. They have higher incidence of depression, and cancer, heart disease, and that kind of stuff. So going to bed early is that's how human beings evolved. When it got dark and people went to bed, and when it got light, they got up. Our normal physiology is linked to that cycle of light and dark. And it doesn't matter you know, what you think or what you want. You can't wish it to be any different. It just is that way, whether you like it or not. And some people, you know, they claim that they're night owls. But that's actually, from a Chinese medicine perspective, that is a pathological state to make you feel awake at night. That's not normal healthy physiology. That's your body out of balance. And then you feel really awake at night. That's not healthy. Um, so you should go to bed early and get up early. And that is one of the keys to longevity and avoiding doctors and staying healthy. There's a lot to be said for that. Then fresh air. I noticed after I got back here, 
in the they arrived in December that the school here they just have all of this closed. It's a little cold outside, but that's not that cold. And they just have all the windows closed and then the heat on is really stuffy. And then they walk around in t shirts. That's just bizarre. <laughs> These people are studying Chinese medicine and and that's the kind of environment they prefer. I was like, let's open all the windows and you put on a sweater. Then we have some air, and you know, you actually face the climate. It's the normal thing to do. It's not like it's you know, 50 below. I think we would prefer it that way. Really? Yeah. But um, facilities that are not that. Oh, well. I will revise <laughs> that. Yeah. I'll talk about that. <laughs> no, but I had students in my class that wanted that, and others didn't want it. First year students? So, yeah, they were first year students. You know, I don't want to argue with facilities either, but I actually did a study at that building, and I think it was really designed for you to have the windows open. I would, I would, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to tell them that. It's really stuffy in there. It's awful. So I just, you know, and I'm up there lecturing, and like really dry throat. Although they do have a filter system to try to, do. to, try to keep. Um, the particulate matter way, way low. Right. And that would get overridden if you open the window. Of course. So that may be. Yeah, but there's not know, that much particulate matter. And there might be a way to isolate out the clinic. Yeah, I don't know. I if just, that's, well, you know, but their claim was that that was a really important thing in Chinese medicine. To have no particulate matter yeah, in the air. Yeah, have the particulate matter really, really low. So well, I, I mean, if, I don't know, maybe. if we were living in Beijing, then I would gladly be exposed. <laughs> but, you know, the air quality here is, as far as I'm concerned, really good. Especially it's raining all the time. There's hardly anything in the air. So, on, a, on the scale of things, you know, the air in Portland is really good. Trust me. After living in China all this year. I mean, when I lived in China, I always had HEPA filters. Like five hundred dollar filters, these really high end type of filters, in every room in my house and in my clinic, and they turn as black as this fabric, and soot accumulates on them. And that's bad. Yeah, they are here. Cold, cold, diesel, this and that and the other. It's just yeah, because there's lots of construction, so it's disgusting. There's just lots of stuff in there. I mean. Sometimes in Beijing, Beijing has some of the worst air quality in China. You can't see more than a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. You can't see some building just down the street. You can look directly at the sun <coughs> and in the middle of the day. Oh, yeah, there's the sun. Mm -hmm. Kind of like those bright LA blue ones. Uh, how long compared to LA, LA is a dream. Oh. How long have you lived there? More than 10 years. Off and on, more than 10 years. And has it gotten better or worse? It's worse. Worse, right? Yeah, it's the yeah. industrial. Some place got better, but most places got worse. My guess is that before there was a lot of heavy industrialization, it was probably much, much better. Yeah, but it's been bad for a long time. It's just people were always you know, burning stuff. Like cooking. Oh, yeah, coal. yeah. For yeah. example, they have these little coal. Um, Stoves in their house, or they just put them outside. It's like a little, mm -hmm. coal, <laughs> yeah. the little thing you can put a chunk of coal in, and then you, you light that thing, and then you put your water kettle on top of that. So everyone just had those and just burning coal right outside their house. Mm -hmm. Raw, yeah. no filter or anything. And there's you know, millions of people. So it was bad for a long time, but now it's just off the charts. In any case, fresh air is really important in Chinese medicine. They call this qing qi. Qing means clear, and qi is qi. But there's clear, there's this clear qi floating around, and that's absorbed by the lung, it passes into the blood, and then makes the blood whole. And then you know, the blood circulates around and nourishes your body. So this qing qi is very important, right? So you need good air. <coughs> so fresh air, open the windows. Like in China, they always open all the even the air outside is awful, but they open all the windows. It's freezing cold. And you're in the clinic wearing these down jackets, and you got your white coat over this 
sticks down the jacket and like, you know, a couple pairs of wool long underwear and it's freezing. But, you know, they still have all the windows open because they like the house. And then no wet hair. This is really a big deal. A lot of Westerners walk around with wet hair because when your hair is wet or any part of your body is wet, then that pulls more heat out of your body, right? Because the water is going to evaporate and it pulls your heat out of you when it evaporates. So that makes cold chi enter your body really, really strong. That's a super bad idea to walk around with wet hair, and especially do not sleep with wet hair. Do not. That's a, you'll get, it's easy to get like a Bell's palsy or migraine headaches as a result of that. Because that cold will, again, impair circulation, impair immune function, send some viruses in there, and affect the facial nerve, and then both Bell's palsy. So don't sleep with my hair. That's a very bad idea. And generally don't walk around with my hair. And then avoid drafts, especially if you don't sleep. Well, it's good to have some window open in the bedroom, but probably you know, the draft is more at the foot of the bed on that side of the room and not crossing your face. Because again, the wind will blow the cold air across you and force the cold heat into the body. Right? And so that's some just basic kind of, kind of common sense stuff, right? And then in terms of diet, Chinese medicine has a lot to say about diet, so I'll just take a few simple things here, nothing very specific. But in general, Chinese prefer warm food and drink. And that's again this whole issue with cold, that Chinese people are very weary of cold. And, and cold also enters the body through diet. And ice drinks, raw food, that's also cold chi that affects your body. So Chinese people don't like, now they do, young people in Shanghai and stuff, they're drinking ice cream. But their grandmothers are all like, you shouldn't do that, it's not for you. you know? So warm stuff is better, it just keeps your body warm, keeps your physiology active, your system active, right? And then eat a lot of vegetables. You can't overeat vegetables. You can overeat almost everything else. It's very difficult to eat too much vegetables. And mostly, Chinese medicine people prefer lightly cooked vegetables. It's easier to digest, and it's not so cold. Energetically, food's hot in nature, and vegetables tend to be on the neutral, cool side. So if you cook them, then they're a little more on the warm side. It's easier to digest, but if you lightly cook them, you still preserve most of the nutrition. Mm -hmm. So what about your raw food? Uh, there's pickles. Chinese people like to eat a lot of pickles and uh, pickles, pickles and stuff. What's that? Pickles are raw. I mean, I suppose. Well, they're raw. You just put raw vegetables in some brine and then take them out a few days later and eat them. Yeah. They have a lot of enzymes. I mean, you can you can eat some. I mean. I'm not going to tell anyone what to eat or not. It's just Chinese medicine, they tend to prefer cooked food. And they eat a little bit of raw food, but not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. And Chinese people have good longevity. You know, they're doing something right. I don't personally think that you need to worry too much about the nutrition that you're going to destroy by cooking food if you cook it lightly. You know, the way Chinese people cook vegetables is they use high heat and they heat up the oil, which is really hot, and then they put the vegetables in and cook it for sometimes 15 seconds. So it's still green, still crunchy, so it still actually retains a lot of that yeah, nutrition. Stuff inside of it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's more yeah, some of it is yeah. destroyed, but some of it's preserved, and overall you can just absorb more of it because it's easier to digest. The cell wall, the cell wall of plants is particularly tough. When you heat things up, those cell walls pop. The water inside the cells expands and makes the cell pop. 
Some of the nutrition is right there. Some of it's destroyed, but what's remaining is easy to absorb. Especially if you have weak digestion. Then raw food, you, even that nutrition is all present, you can't even absorb a lot of what's there. Because it's so hard to digest. Well, so lightly so cooked yeah, food is... Really like, lightly cooked yeah. stuff. Yeah, or just steam and so things are still a little crunchy, they still have their color or you fry things. And you know, I think with vegetables in particular, you have to make them taste good. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you just steam vegetables. everything, then you're gonna get really bored of eating vegetables. <laughs> so you have to cook them with some stuff. Some <laughs> broth and some sauce and this and that and make them really delicious. Then you can eat mountains of vegetables, and no problem. So vegetables in China, usually they cook with some soup stock. So when you go to Chinese restaurants, they're like, oh, it's vegetarian. It's, it's got soup stock. Yeah. That's why the vegetables taste so good, you know. So anyway, you eat a lot of lightly cooked vegetables. Green leafy, that's kind of what I'm referring to here. And then in the fall and winter, it's good to eat those kinds of things. Squash, pumpkin, the root vegetables. Those kinds of things, especially squash and pumpkin, they're really good for the digestive system. In terms of called pea. Pea means spleen, but it's really something to do with your digestive system. And in Chinese medicine, you have this five phase theory. Ooh, what would you say? The wood, fire, earth, metal, water, like that. And Earth, which is spleen, digestion, is the mother of metal, which is very good for the body. So one way to strengthen the lung, which is good for the wei qi, this defensive qi and the immune system in general, is to take care of the digestive system, the spleen itself. So they call it pei tu shen ji, bolster of earth to generate metal. So strengthen the digestive system to strengthen the lung. Right? So those kinds of things are really good for the digestive. Make the digestive system really happy. And then the lung, in turn, is really strong. Then your immune system is stronger and you don't get sick. And then soups. In, in China, we always, they say, means four dishes, four you know, course meal, and a soup. That's a meal. There's no meal without soup. Soup is how you can So that, like, always have soup. Chinese people always have soup, because that helps warm your digestive system. Mm -hmm. Have some warm broth, then that warms things up and gets everything going to make your digestion proceed really efficiently and your digestion's happy. You know? Digestion in Chinese medicine is very central to overall health. It's very important to take care of digestion. That's really key to, to health in general. So the whole school of Chinese medicine, they call pi wei tai, so the spleen and stomach stream of medicine. They just talk, not only, but they emphasize a lot on digestion. It's, that's core to health. So in any case, diet is very important to maintaining your zheng qi, your body's strength and prevent colds, right? And then these kind of things are just better to avoid. Everyone knows that, right? You know, I don't even know why I put this slide there. Everyone knows that already. Like all this kind of refined food, most of it's junk. And sugars, there's all kinds of research on how much sugar causes cancer, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and deep fried food, typically deep fried food, you know, because you, you usually get it at restaurants, right? You don't do that at home so much. But oil oh, is garbage. Yeah. Yeah, I do deep fried foods at home in olive oil. Yeah, if you use good quality oil, then okay, you can have some deep fried food. But for mostly restaurants, oil is expensive. You know? yeah. so they're going to use it until use they oil. just can't use it anymore. <laughs> I mean, in China, you just never have anything deep Right, because in China they have this stuff called eco yo. It means the gutter oil. It's the oil that they collect from kitchens. You know, from the cooking process, like there's some oil in the, in the 
hood and some oil collecting here and they just scoop all that stuff mm -hmm. up and then they put it, all that stuff in a big container and these people come around and collect it and they take it to these factories and refine it and then they sell it back to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. It's fully illegal, but they still do it. So yeah. Um, and then spicy food, because spicy food is very dry. And already autumn and the lungs are dryness, right? Mm -hmm. And the lung despises dryness. So spicy food tends to create more dryness in the body and impair the lung function. So a little bit of spicy is okay, but not you know, every day lots and lots of spicy food. This tends to make the lung a little hot and dry and susceptible to getting sick. And then like I was saying about cold and raw food and drink, okay, a little bit here and there, especially when the weather's warm, you need more of that. But going into fall and winter, it's starting to get cold, so you shouldn't have so much of that. I think by nature, too, um, the foods that are naturally available, I mean, we could buy anything in the grocery store right now, but the foods right. that are really naturally available to you, Right. Like coming to autumn really need to be cooked. Yeah. And That's right. through the middle of the winter, it's all processed in some way. Right. I mean, you can't really, if you could, you could take a cabbage and eat it raw, but it's kind of better to make a soup out of it or something, right? Most of the stuff that you would be eating in the winter, like you said, it's better cooked anyway. So that's just kind of. Yeah, that's how getting... people used to live, and now we don't have to live that way because we can. Have bananas from Ecuador in the winter. Yeah, we go buy tomato. Yeah. Make a nice salad. Right. Hot cucumber. house tomatoes yeah. from Mexico in the middle of winter. Yeah. yeah, it's not really natural. So. And then here's a little. Um, how much time? We're kind of over. We're almost the end. So. Um, here's one little food therapy treatment for preventing colds. So if you're out and about and you get chilled and you're out in the cold and rain and wind and you feel a little bit chill, then maybe you think you're going to get a cold. If you feel some little scratch in your throat, or maybe you don't, but you're just worried you might get sick because you tend to get sick when that happens or something. But you, you just, nothing more than you feel a little teeny scratch. If you're already sick, full on cold, this won't work. This has to be just when you feel like you might be getting sick. Then you take some fresh ginger and slice it, maybe six or eight slices, like a few millimeters thick, like a, a quarter of an inch thick, or less, an eighth of an inch thick, maybe. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter how much. And then put that in some water, maybe a cup and a half or two cups, and boil it for five to 10 minutes until you, know, you have this pretty strong ginger tea. Then add some brown sugar to taste and drink that really hot. And what that does is essentially just warms your body up. Because mm -hmm. here you've gotten chill, so your core temperature is a little bit low, and then when your core temperature is a little bit low, your immune system function goes down. So then those viruses have a chance to take over and you get sick. So this, just when that's starting to happen, the viruses haven't really got the upper hand, but you feel them in there, you know, they're starting to, to, to get there. Then you take this, and it just ramps up your immune system. The and ginger is really warming. And it opens on the cortical. Yeah. So it, you've actually got that contraction going on. Exactly. Yeah, because ginger is warm and spicy and it's a little bit diaphoretic. It makes you sweat. So it helps push the cold chi out. Because the cold chi invades through the body, through the surface of the body. So it's the Chinese medicine idea. So the cold chi is now on a very superficial layer of the body. And then the warm ginger just pushes it out. And why is the sugar in there? So, <coughs> Well, um, your body needs a little bit of some instant fuel to just 
stoke the immune system, to stoke the qi. And sugar is the fastest food there is. It just goes right into your blood and becomes glucose food for your cells and for your white blood cells. So that sugar is in there to just give you a little bit of qi to help your body push this cold out. And I, I guarantee you, if you do that, at the very first sign of the cold, and also if you have wet clothes or anything like that, you have to change out of that immediately. Wet air, you can fly it. And then you wrap up in a blanket and drink that and make yourself really, really warm. And you want to sweat a tiny little bit, just a tiny little bit. That sweat shows that your body temperature is maxed out. Right? You just start to sweat and your body temperature reaches its, its maximum. Point. Then you sweat to sort of start to disperse your body. So you want to just get yourself hot enough where you sweat a tiny little bit. Then you're, you know, your body's working at its best at that temperature. And you can usually fight off the cold by doing that. And then the other thing you can do is this, a foot bath. You got a basin, preferably deep, preferably like that. In China, you can get those anywhere, but I never saw one here. Maybe you could have one made or you know, like a wood cedar basin or something. Um, and you want to soak your feet in hot water that's as hot as you can tolerate without burning yourself. So it's kind of hard to get your feet in, but obviously you don't burn yourself. Um, and you want the water covering at least up to, you know, like here. Somewhere up a third or halfway up your lower leg, right? And then you s just soak in that hot water until your whole body feels really warm. So what about um, whole body bath? It's not as important <clears throat> or Well, when you're, when, you, when you're getting a cold like that, then you don't really want to expose your whole oh, body. Oh, okay. Yeah. So here, you're actually, and you, if your clothes are wet, you change out of wet clothes and put on warm clothes yeah, and then you wrap up in a blanket and, and then you put your feet in that hot water and drink that ginger tea. And I guarantee you, within a matter of minutes, you'll feel really, really warm and start to even sweat a little bit. Then if you sweat too much, you, you've got to, you know, if your shirt gets wet or something like that, you've got to change your shirt and take a dry towel and wipe the sweat off. Then you can get in bed and rest. Then you won't get sick. Nine times out of ten that works for preventing cold. But it just has to be right when you think you're about to get sick. If you're already sick, it's too late. This won't do anything. This part just makes you worse. It won't help much. Okay. So that's really common in China. People do this. Like a lot of people in China, they have this big basin for a foot bath. And they have little massagers in them. You can go to the department store and they have all these fancy foot bathing machines with little jets and massagers and stuff. And there's all different kind of herbs you can buy to put in there. If you go to some pharmacy and there's like a hundred different formulas, one for insomnia and blood pressure and headaches and painful menstruation and this and that and the other, all these little foot bath preparations. So you can put stuff in the water too, for arthritis or gout. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then herbs are just much more complicated. We'll get into that. Like I said, there's no simple remedy, really, from a Chinese medicine perspective. It's very com complex treating colds. But some common stuff that probably some of you have heard of, like Yin Chao San and Gang Mao Li. Those kind of things you can just buy at health food stores. I personally don't recommend those things. Because yin chao san is for a very specific type of gamma. It has to be wind, heat, gamma, very early stage. And then it's, you, know, you have a little cough, and actually that's not very good. Then you should take you know, something else like sangju. It just gets very complicated. So, you know, that may or may not work. I personally have never had much success using that in China myself. When I first started studying Chinese medicine, I wasn't very sophisticated about it. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, just take Yin Chao San. And I would try that, and I 
If I take introspection, I get better in a week. If I don't take it, I get better in a week. <laughs> well, it's not doing very much, you know. And same with this gum hopping. Kui Jutang. Kui Jutang is almost just like a soup, a cinnamon twig decoction. It's just like some sweet cinnamon soup, which is kind of nice. That, I think, works better, but usually you can't get that in the uh, in, uh, pill form. You have to cook it yourself. But that's similar to the, to the ginger tea. Same kind of idea. Cinnamon warms your body up, and then there's some dates and licorice and some ginger in there, too, that helps you know, nourish the jump chi and make your, your jump chi strong, and then you can fight off the infection. So anyway, that's kind of more complicated. And then if you get you know, frequent respiratory tract infections, there's a lot of different possible causes for that. And Chinese medicine is often really useful to treat that. But that, again, is more involved when you receive something to take care of that. It's not, it's not so simple. And same thing if you people get respiratory tract infections that they easily get bronchitis or asthma. Those things also usually can treat with Chinese medicine. But that again is very complicated. So that's it. So now you have a few tools to stay healthy. That ginger tea is amazing though. It tastes good too. Just add enough sugar that yeah. you know you like it.